with this treatment, which is sometimes called fielded panels because they're arranged in a certain way, uh, or uh, just raised paneling. And that's, uh, that's just a, a hallmark. Usually one or both sides, there are closets. Um, this has one side. Uh, interior decorative treatment is um, sort of the um, uh, archetype of, of the rural 18th century domestic architecture. Sometimes in houses where the, the owners were too, uh, of, of too low a, a economic status to afford it, you'll find that they just have plain boards. But anyone that had any resources at all would try to finish at least the fireplace walls. Don't do much for you insulation-wise anyways. The key thing in an old house in terms of insulation is you want to make sure that there's no area up where the wall meets the sill where uh, air can, and wind can get up through there. You want to make sure it can't get around your windows. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes in the houses where they replace the windows with those Victorian windows that have the weight pockets, you know, that mm -hmm. have the weights, those are terrible from an energy point of view. So um, keep it, the air infiltration is usually the bigger issue with an old house and it's something that you can address by, by uh, going and making sure that the wind isn't blowing up through the clapboards underneath. Um, generally speaking it is not cost effective unless you've got the wall down anyways for some other reason to try to insulate the walls of an old house. The roof, the attic, very important. What you can do with the windows and doors, very important. But uh, we have a house of a little later date than this, and you probably had the same experience. You get a real windy day, and you just can't get warm, because there's so much air blowing through the house. Uh, but that's really the issue with these. The here probably, uh, again, is something that dates from around 1810 or so. And this was actually intended to be fancier than the other room. This was more up to date, and in that by 1810 or so, the raised panel look had become old fashioned. That was a previous generation or two. And plaster, painted wall, painted plaster walls, sometimes painted plaster walls with stenciling became more common. And uh, um, there was a lot more inter interest in, in multiplicity of moldings. You see how this stepped molding here uh, that comes out. That's, that's part of the fanciness of that period, whereas the colonial period was very plain. Mm -hmm. By around 1810 or so, you're getting this uh, attempt to look uh, mm -hmm. much more formal and, and fancy. So I think that at some point, like around 1810 or so, they considered this the best room that the second best room and that mm. this would have been they might have called this the best parlor the other one the lesser parlor or uh, this may have been the only parlor and that one may have been being used as a bedroom at that time mm. so you can see that uh, that there's been some updating as people became more fashion you said that those beams were covered yeah that that was never would never show in a yeah. good house yeah that's that is the case. Um, and the way you can usually tell that is this. Um, where they did intend for the bottom of a beam to show, you would usually with, you would usually see some attempt to um, decorate it, either with a uh, um, chamfering, in other words, beveling off this surface, mm -hmm. or at least you'd see a lot of paint on it. You don't see, uh, or you, another thing is, you'd see them attempt to plane it a little bit if mm -hmm. it were meant to show. See, yeah. this has been Some of them are pretty competently, yeah, the smaller ones are sawn out, right? But mm -hmm. the big ones are, are uh, taken out with a broad ax. Mm -hmm. um, and they're very nicely done, but still, then it's yeah. still not so well done that you'd want that to show. So that would have been cleaned up a lot more. Mm -hmm. And what you see here with the, lath marks and the plaster marks on here. Um, that probably was the level of the of the ceiling across the whole thing mm -hmm. at some point. Did some little thing like that to mm. kind of relieve it of its total plainness. Mm. Do they
Okay. All right, you have stairs Bathroom. downstairs there, right? Yeah, because they had an outhouse, so. Yeah. Um, usually these rooms were the full. Uh, area. Yeah. Okay. Full area. So they so put that in. That would have been part of that. That would have been part of that pantry storage. Okay. Um, so do you suppose that wall right there is was put in later, or uh, was the pantry behind that wall? It looks so much like the other walls, but uh, it doesn't have the um, no, paint in the grooves as much. Yeah, it's 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 probably like the cabinets. It's the old boards. Yeah. But not but used in a. Okay. I'll tell you. Here's the difference between these two walls. This wall. All right. This wall is either a single or double layer of planks. All right, of boards really, mm -hmm. not even planks. All right, so this is a board wall, a batten wall. It's they're nailed at the top, nailed at the bottom, and that's your wall. Mm -hmm. Right. That's not how we build a modern wall. We put studs in, and then we cover it mm -hmm. with boards, and and that's pretty much what you got here. Um, we had a species called yellow northern pine, mm -hmm. which is about twice as hard as uh, regular white pine, and um, a lot of times that is what was used, uh, but that was cut off probably by about 1830 or so. That was entirely cut off, and when mm. they wanted hard pine, they had to import it from the southern states. Mm. Uh, the walls, though, the there, that, let me go over and look yep. at that, okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that is uh, that's oak or chestnut. I'm not sure which. Mm -hmm. But um, this 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 is not. This is okay. the hard pine. Mm -hmm. That I think is the outside wall. In further north in New England, they went to great trouble to have the house face south or get the get the, get the yeah. heat from the from the sun. Here in Connecticut, it seems to have been uh, a lot. Uh, less of a factor, and you find that that by the I want to say certainly the second half of the 18th century, everywhere in Connecticut, um, you find they're really trying to face the road more than to face south. Mm -hmm. So that 90 percent of your houses are going to face the road, but if they don't face the road, they face south. Yeah. And as you go further back into the early years of the 18th century, my experience has been, and I'm basing this all on existing houses because we don't, mm -hmm. I mean, we don't know a lot about the houses that didn't survive. Okay? Yeah. If they were the same as the ones that did survive, or if they were different. <laughs> but based on the houses that I have seen, um, the earlier back you go in the 18th century, the more common it was to not face the road, but to deliberately face south. And I think that what we have here is a, a, is a deliberately south-facing house that was accessed yeah. off another road. Now, Scott could tell you when they put this road in. I don't know. It's a pretty uh, early road. I mean, they, 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 Bunker couldn't Hill was in, a, they couldn't have put it in until they built a bridge of some sort. Yeah. Um, but uh, I know in the 1780s when the French troops went through, they talked about that being the main oh. road to Coventry. From, from uh, Andover, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. uh, I made as a closet, and usually the type of panel, the the um, molding on the edge, which is called the feathering, mm -hmm. right? The, a feathered edge panel. Usually that's carried through in all the doorways, so that it gives a sort of uh, consistency to it. Um, Were those handmade or? Oh, these. Oh, yeah. The the, pa the yeah, panels. Yeah, these are all these are all hand planed. The edges are planed with a with an uh, uh, an edge plane that cuts this um, shape, and then the surface is planed uh, either with a, a broad first with a, a draw knife type uh, plane, and then uh, with a with a um, straight plane. Now those would be all handmade. Now here in Andover, uh, also Coventry, Bolton, that area, um, we find that the masonry or the fireplace and the chimney is this hard stone, sometimes called Bolton stone, which is uh, uh, you know the outcropping of the bedrock here that became uh, so important. This Bolton stone was quarried 
early in the 18th century. A lot of it was used for tombstones. Uh, and it made a very nice stone because it splits nicely. It doesn't split in an irregular way. In fact, in the Victorian period, they were making paving blocks out of this because they could make them so, so regular. But, uh, so you find in, in these houses in Andover and the vicinity, you find some really nice stone fireplaces. And where so did I, they get that stone? Uh, up, do you know where the Methodist Church is? Up on uh, Route 44. Mm -hmm. That, it's all in that area. That quarry, I think it's still being worked, or at least it was until just a it was few, right. few years mm -hmm. ago, because mm -hmm. it, uh, but that's, uh, that's where the, the, the vicinity of that ridge in Bolton Notch is where mm -hmm. that's, that type of stone comes from. Mm -hmm. and, that, and you see a lot of that around here. Everything in this room looks original to me. From what I can see, these are old um, wide board chestnut floors. Um, the windows. The windows are old, but probably not original to the house. These windows date from about 1800, 1810, and uh, the earlier windows, the mutton, this part here, was much um, wider. So even though we see some old glass in this window here, like this, this pane in particular looks, looks very old, uh, and the window frames themselves uh, look to date to that period, although they might be very high quality uh, replacements over time. The uh, family has owned the house every generation except a family friend owned it for about 20 years. Uh-huh, uh-huh. So. Well, what you find with windows oftentimes is you think that they're all exactly alike, but if you actually come and measure them, you'll find that they aren't, that hmm. one rotted out or hmm. broke or whatever, and so they replaced it in kind. But uh, the older colonial style had a much wider bar here, and this was adopted because it made for a lighter, let in more light, and also mm -hmm. looked more light. So around 1800, 1810 is when you find this type of window coming in. Now I was looking at your attic windows, and so many times the attic windows were never replaced. So when we get up there, oh, okay. I'll, I will, uh, I will look at that. This chair rail here um, is also probably a feature that dates from about the same time as, as the windows, about 1810 or so. Prior to that, uh, you don't find this very often in the front rooms. Mm -hmm. So I would think that that might be an updating too, although, yeah, I'm pretty sure that would be an updating from about 18, 1810 or so. Mm. So let's go around to the former kitchen area. The keeping room, yeah. Okay, this room uh, originally would have, room. would have been the uh, the kitchen, the in a sense, the main room mm -hmm. of the house in terms of all the cooking going on here, a lot of the activity, like the woman would have a spinning wheel in here, the man would have the best chair of the house in here, and this would be the fire that would be most likely kept going uh, m m most of the time. The other fires they would like if they had people in those rooms, if people were maybe using those rooms for sleeping, but this would have been the important fireplace. Keeping. And again, you got some tremendous hearthstones. Everything, the hearth, the white board floors looks very original here. Um, this, I presume, covers the side oven. Yes. Um, one thing that probably strikes me as having been if not replaced but kind of switched around would be the door covering the ovens because it doesn't seem to fit within a, f a frame here. It doesn't seem to fit within the way the interior trim mm -hmm. in this room goes. If you look, 
the interior trim is very plain on that side and it really just consists of a couple of added moldings around a very plain opening. But this raised panel is part of a sort of a fancier interior trim that's more appropriate to the front rooms. The beaded board tongue and groove wall that you see right there, that looks, um, although the finish is has been kind of um, cleaned up, it probably it probably had a natural stained finish in something called Spanish brown, which is the kind of brown that you see more like up on the beams. Mm -hmm. uh, that makes a very dark room. Mm. And if you go, if you if, if you had that, you you'd uh, <laughs> you'd probably think you'd want to have some floodlights in here. But anyway, very <laughs> common finish was that reddish brown. That looks, and then in the Victorian period, they always painted over it and everything else. That looks like at one point, and maybe you can tell me if this is true, that was a painted wall that you took the paint off? We didn't. You didn't? It no. was done before 56. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. well may, Alice may have had it done. No, I yeah. don't think so. It was before that. Yeah. And there's buttermilk on the doors. Well, all right. So, uh, but that's, uh, that's original, this great batten door here, which is, looks to be made of the same sort of tongue and groove. Uh, uh, boards. Uh, that looks to be original. This is, oh, and this room points out an interesting thing that you see in these houses. Just like us today, you know, if you've got to mow your lawn, which do you mow first? You mow the front lawn first. Don is always saying to me, if you can't get the whole thing mowed, i got people coming over, at least mow the front lawn, right? Well, the same thing in the way they finish these houses. You'll find the front rooms will have a fielded panels around the fireplace walls, because those were mm -hmm. the rooms that were considered more formal, more important. The back rooms will be finished in uh, the plain boards, the tongue and groove boards, the matched boards. And the back rooms being, if there's like an entrance, uh, side entrance like that, the kitchen, and the two rooms off either side of the kitchen. The two rooms off either side of the kitchen, usually, uh, one was a uh, buttery or pantry, was fitted with shelves, and uh, there would be a lot of storage of crockery, storage of, of cheeses, things like that uh, in there. And sometimes you can see the shelf marks on the walls. Let's go take in um, 1956, when um, our aunt restored the house, uh -huh. the, this section over here had shelves. Oh, oh that okay. Was all right. That was kind of the pantry. Okay. Um, the other, uh, one room would usually be a pantry, and you're saying that that was... Uh, it was all shelves, and uh -huh. they took the shelves and made the cabinets out oh, of the, sh out of the original shelves. In the... Huh. Or so she says. <laughs> I believe it. <laughs> Believe it. Um, the other room, sometimes is called the morning room, uh, was typically used as a small bedroom, and uh, it got the name morning room because, again, this fireplace would be kept going more than the others. Some of the houses didn't have fireplaces upstairs; they didn't have, uh, uh, um, you know, heated sleeping areas. So if there was a woman who was expecting, uh, or if there was a sick person, that might be a good place for them because they would be closest to the fire that would be kept going the most. So uh, that's how we got the name Borning Room. But typically, one small room off the kitchen, a pantry, the other a small bedroom or, or Borning Room. Let me get a picture of your uh, fireplace here, okay? You, you want to move that chair? As you may know, one of the things that happened over the course of the 18th century is that as they discovered how strong oak and chestnut were, the framing of the houses tended to get lighter. They tended to be very heavy in the beginning, and then they tended to get, uh, they realized they could get away with uh, less. So you find in the old houses you have these flaring posts like you see in this room. And uh, like the house we saw that was built around 1800, it had the straight posts. There wasn't any flair to it. So that's, a, that's another thing that 
supports the uh, the uh, early to mid 18th century dating for this house. Now another thing I wonder, if you, you've never had these walls down, right? No. I suspect that there are no studs in these outside walls. I suspect that these outside walls are, oh. are uh, thick oak or chestnut boards uh, butted up against each other and either nailed or pegged into the house frame. Because it doesn't seem, just looking at this, Hmm. It, it looks awful. It looks awful thin to me. But I, it may be that there are that there are uh, studs to that. So that would that have more or less insulating value? Um. Uh, well, it means you can't insulate it. I mean, there's just no way yeah. to insulate a, a plank wall like that. Mm -hmm. But hmm. in point of fact, the, the wall and may at one time have been completely unfinished. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we don't in entirely know. Second floor. Um, this is some of the things that you see here that um, are interesting are the uh, collar ties to the rafters. This is to brace the roof, each one pinned in place. Um, that was... Sometimes in the smaller houses you don't see the collar ties because the roof isn't so big that maybe you need it, but uh, I think it's just an extra thing to, st to strengthen it. Uh, and it makes for a very good roof. I didn't really check outside, but I didn't see too much sag to the roof. So I think it's holding mm -hmm. up. Hi. Hi good. That's my son. Yeah, I'm Bruce Cluett. Hi, I'm John Jones. He's room. Yeah, you know, um, even when these upstairs weren't finished, they use them for a lot of different things. I mentioned looms because cheese room. Uh, Sometimes a loom took up. If they had a loom, it took up a lot of space. And a lot of times, if they couldn't fit it in down by where the fireplace was, you'd find that would be something they would put upstairs mm -hmm. on a second floor because it uh, it took up a lot of space. Oftentimes, you find in these uh, second floor spaces, it'd be a lot of hooks to hang things. Um, they had to store a lot of things. Uh, one of the big challenges of colonial living was storing the food that you raised. You mentioned cheese. That was, it's not that they loved cheese so much as if you, how are you going to get dairy products all year round? Okay, you can get milk in the summertime. Mm. Um, the cows tended to dry up during the winter for one thing. If you weren't feeding cows green feed, uh, the, the, they would stop giving milk or it would certainly be greatly reduced. So the amount of milk you could get in the winter was um, reduced. Second of all, what are you going to do with all that milk? How are you going you can't keep milk without refrigeration. So cheese was in place of refrigeration. You could make it into something that you could put in a cool dry place and it would last, if not forever, it would certainly last mm -hmm. all year round. Think about what else they did with their food. Um, apples. Apples were made into cider. That was something else that, that if you put it up carefully in barrels, uh, the worst that would happen is that it might get a little fizzy and, and that wasn't so bad either. But apples were another way of preserving the food, smoking the meat, drying the, the, the uh, material. Um, either uh, apples or, or meat was dried as well. All of those things were ways of making sure that you could eat all year round. And if you were going to do that, you had to have a place to store it. Mm -hmm. So the attics, and I'm referring, when I say attic, I'm referring to this whole second floor space. Uh, so one or both sides might be finished off into a bedroom, but the rest of the space was still very important because they would have baskets and bins of corn up here mm -hmm. and they would be hanging up uh, uh, various things on hooks mm -hmm. and they might even have a smoke chamber up here off the chimney. Uh, uh, you can't really see the chimney because it's enclosed here but this would be if they had uh, an inside place for smoking meat this is wh where it would be. Mm -hmm. So this was a very important part of the house even though it's mm -hmm. you know not 
no one was, ex you wouldn't expect outside people to come up here. This is just a family yeah. area. So there's no fanciness to it. There's no, you know, paint or finish or mm -hmm. woodwork or anything else. But still a very important mm -hmm. part of the house. Will they store much food in the basement? Um, in crocks. They would store food in crocks in the basement. They have, I don't know if you noticed, there was a skid on the floor, yep. a great big skid. They kept the kegs of cider. You barreled that. stuff, and that would include meat too, because mm -hmm. if meat, meat was dried, it would be packed in a barrel. Hmm. And our apples, whole apples could be packed in a barrel, but of course we know the saying, it takes only one bad apple to spoil the barrel, right? Uh, it was tricky keeping, yeah. keeping fruit going. Um, and also in the cellar, they would either dig in the cellar floor if it was dirt, or they would actually build these boxes of sand, and they would put their roots in sand. They might have a separate root cellar uh, mm -hmm. somewhere else, but if they didn't, they would devote a part of the cellar to root storage. And roots would be, you know, your carrots, mm -hmm. potatoes, turnips. Okay, so that would overcome yeah. some of that humidity. Yeah, and also mice don't like to go through sand apparently. Oh. So uh, you would hmm. you would uh, sift the sand every year to get all the mm -hmm. organic material out, or get new sand, or whatever. But hmm. you would store a lot of stuff in that in that hmm. uh, sandy area of the basement. However, other things like um, like grain um, seems to and corn especially seems to have been uh, stored in the attics. I think because it was hot and dry, because mm -hmm. you wouldn't want to have the corn. Uh, mm -hmm. And the corn was usually stored on the cob, and then you would shell it as you needed it. And corn was almost exclusively used for animal feed at that time. Mm -hmm. um, some corn was ground up for flour, but the main, va the main value of corn was as animal feed, because the whole economy of the farm depended upon keeping your animals going. Um, you had to plow, you had to haul stuff, and so you had to have those draft animals, and they, you know, the old expression, eat like a horse, right? You had to have a lot of feed for the horse, and, and for the oxen as well. So you, you, you might have a hundred acres, a lot of it would go into hay, mm -hmm. a lot of it would go into your basic feed grains, corn, uh, rye, oats, barley, uh, which would be uh, be for the animals, and some animals you'd be fattening up for meat as well. You'd be fattening mm -hmm. up hogs, um, and then whatever was left over of corn and uh, and wheat and buckwheat, you would use for your own flour as well. Mm -hmm. But the reason they grew so much corn uh, was that they had to feed livestock. Mm -hmm. uh, right, if clay and yeah, and see. When you went outside, the mortar was fairly expensive. So a lot of times, particularly in the earlier houses, you see that um, they um, piled the stones up and they uh, pressed in the clay to hold it together. And that's fine as long as you keep it dry. Mm -hmm. But of course, you couldn't have this outside. So outside, if they had mortar mm -hmm. in the chimney, mm -hmm. and I think they were, that even with a stone chimney like this, it's stone above the roof, right? Yeah. It's not brick. Uh, it's stone. Yeah. Stone. Yeah. Stone. Uh, there you'll see they'll use regular lime mortar. Hmm. But uh, inside, particularly in the early houses, you see this uh, see this clay, mm -hmm. which is in really good shape when you think about how old that is. Yeah, the inside of the fireplace is getting a little marginal. Yeah. Down, so we don't use it too much. That was one of the purposes of the heating system. Now this is interesting because. Remember what I said about the collar ties on the roof showing that the roof was really uh, very strongly framed? Mm -hmm. You also have a ridge pole here, which is a little unusual in houses of this period. Most of the time you just have the rafters meet against each other, but you see how you have a ridge piece there? Oh, up at the top? Yeah. Hmm. Um, you, don't, you don't usually see that. Um, i to turn on the light so we can see. Oh, okay. Hmm. Yeah. And yeah. that accounts for the... Remember I said I thought the roof was nice and straight? Mm -hmm. That helps 
that does, that's not really structural in the sense mm. of holding up the roof. It doesn't perform any function in holding up the roof, but it does keep it from getting that sway back look that some of the mm -hmm. old colonial houses have. Mm. Well, I, also, your raptors are very big. They're very thick. I kind of like to know. I kind of like to know more about that. Oh, well, that's really good. You can even I'm see some a, notches. Uh, yeah. Believe. Now, around about 1800, um, they they realized the importance of the ridge piece and keeping the roof straight. And after 1800, every house was built with a ridge piece of some kind. Mm. But I don't believe that's an 1800 ridge piece, and here's why. Mm. Um, the, 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 the ones that were used in that period are very distinctively shaped. They're five-sided. Um, and this is not, this is not, this is a uh, uh, four-sided, not four regular size, but it's a four-sided mm -hmm. piece. And I believe that, that uh, that's original to the house. It certainly mm -hmm. dates the house. And there certainly ridge pieces were used in the 17th century, so it's not impossible. I'm just saying mm -hmm. that usually in small houses of this type, you don't see mm -hmm. a, a roof framing with a ridge piece. Well, that's good to know. Okay. Except for maybe in the very, very earliest years of settlement. In other words, every house after 1660 pretty much used the same type of roof, which would have been a cedar roof. Uh, they uh, greatly valued um, the uh, cedar swamps in the area. Um, many towns have a cedar swamp road. Some towns even went so far as to kind of divide up the cedar swamp among the various townspeople so everybody would have a, oh. a source of cedars. And those cedars are not like the ones that we see today in that they had been growing a long time, so they were pretty good shape. And most of the time you see a cedar now, it's just a little spindly thing. Maybe you can make a fence post out of or what. Mm -hmm. But they did have some good cedars that they could, they could uh, split into, mm -hmm. into shingles. And so they were all... Uh, they were all cedar roofs. Okay. Uh, the covering, uh, which you wouldn't want to reproduce, I can assure you. Uh, generally speaking, probably the most common material was pine clapboards. Uh, sometimes cedar clapboards, sometimes oak clapboards. Mm -hmm. um, oak makes a pretty good clapboard, although it's really hard. But um, it, it does, if it's nice and dry, it will split well into a clapboard. That must have been hard cl uh, nailing it on. I think you would have had to pretty well pre-drill the holes. Oh, okay. Yeah. And, and, mm -hmm. and also, they would have been nailing into, I think, oak sheeting yeah, on this house. So it, it definitely that, yeah. would have been hard. But most of the ho old houses seem to have been uh, pine clapboards. Mm -hmm. And they don't last long. Mm -hmm. Your cedar lasts a lot longer and looks the same. Mm -hmm. um, Shingles were used on the exterior of houses, but um, judging from the pictures that you see, like photography came in in the 1860s, and so there's some pictures of old New England houses. Um, most of them seem to have clapboards. Uh, they specific, like when they, where we have specific records of houses, uh, where people are writing down what they bought to build the house, and there's very few of those, but of those that we have, Almost always they talk about clapboards, mm -hmm. buying clapboards uh, for the exterior. Once in a while, um, uh, shingles. Mm -hmm. Either shingles or clapboards are correct, mm -hmm. but I would s estimate that maybe 80% were clapboards. Mm -hmm. Now my other question is, what is it that they put in between the wide boards? When we moved in, it was all crumbly. Somebody said horsehair and plaster, but what, what would be the, your guess? Um, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> it looked like cement. Yeah, there. I don't know what was put in originally. One thing that probably is the case is that um, the boards fit a lot better. In, the boards have shrunk over time. So. Um, oh, okay. We probably have more of a problem with the seams showing mm -hmm. than, than they did. In the 
40s or so, um, people did various things to deal with the cracks that had become evident in the old colonial floors. And before that, it wasn't that much of a problem because like in the Victorian period, they covered them all up anyways. But a lot of times you'll see people have put in thin strips to cover up floors like, well, I don't know. I've done that. Oh, he, all right. Okay. He's done most. There yeah, were a few. That that, there were a few that then were already there, there. There was a material that was called water putty. Have you ever heard of water putty? I'm not sure what it consisted mm -hmm. of, but it was a fairly inexpensive thing that you could color and, and drive into the cracks. And that was fine, but it wasn't all that resilient. So maybe about 20 or 30 years later, it got very cracked and crumbly. And you're probably talking about digging out water putty. That, that, that was, sounds like it. That was maybe put in the 40s or uh -huh. so. Okay. Uh, but now, your, the original question is, in the colonial period, did they do anything to cover up the cracks? And I don't know the answer to that. Yeah, yeah. mostly I was just wondering what that putty was. Water putty, is my guess. Yeah. It's quite hard, but it get, it, once it starts to deteriorate, forget it. you got to dig it all out and put mm -hmm. something else in, because it will just continue to, to crack forever. Okay, okay uh... I'm Ed Shapiro with the Andover Historical Society. I'm the secretary of the group. And Bruce Clouet is Bruce Clouet. Yeah. yeah. And uh, very gracious to come down and look at the very well known homes in Andover. And, and I'll introduce uh, Bruce to talk. I've got a PhD in history from the university, from UConn. And um, I've been working since 1975 doing historic sites research, writing about old houses. Uh, writing them up for the National Register of Historic Places, uh, National Historic Landmarks, things like that. Mm -hmm. So uh, I've seen, a, and it's mostly been in Connecticut, so I've seen quite a few houses in this area. Uh, yeah. And I've now seen another one, which I'm grateful for. Boy, what a lot of stone, huh? Yeah, it takes up the entire cellar, really. Yeah. And you can see here how, uh, you know, for the ordinary stonework of the chimney foundation, they're using big field stone. Shaped a little bit, but not a whole lot. Same with the foundation wall, until they get to the very top, which forms an underpinning that might be visible. And then they're using nicer stone, more carefully shaped, Oh, mm -hmm. I see. Yeah, yeah, I never noticed that. Yeah, yeah, more carefully shaped stone. They've done some work on it over the years. You can see there's a cement slab where that yeah. window is, and they've mortared that yeah. wall over. I think that was intended to slow up the water a little bit when it comes in, but I don't think it's Yeah, well, good. my yeah. experience has been when the water wants to come in, yeah. you better <laughs> get used to it. Yeah, I, I wouldn't have wasted my time if it was me. But, um, did you have water this spring? We had terrible water. Nah, some. We I had know. a wall that was like this in our cellar, and it was coming uh, coming out of every joint. Yeah. Because <laughs> it was like the whole water table had just risen up, mm. you know, and there was no resisting mm -hmm. that. I want to just take another closer look at your stonework here. People all over, especially in northern you know, heavy outdoor uh, uh, boilers. Uh huh. And so, oh. so instead of putting it outdoors.